today we believe will be uh, life-saving for family members as well as for individuals who are struggling with addiction. Your question over to Dave, who's going to handle anything related to the specifics in the drugs. Uh, thank you, Diane. Uh, again, my name is David Fialco. I'm a certified prevention specialist with the Council of Southeast Pennsylvania. Um, so an opioid is basically, uh, it comes in two forms. It's uh, both a fully uh, a synthetic, uh, uh, a partially synthetic, a natural, and fully synthetic. The ones that are really kind of in the news right now um, that are taking lives are what's called a fully synthetic opioid or an analog opioid. And these are drugs which are uh, man-made, they do not come from the opium poppy plant, um, the poppy plant. Um, they are fully synthesized in a laboratory. And they vary in strength from 10 times to 1,000 times more uh, powerful than um, morphine um, and heroin both. So um, some of them, you've heard of the fentanyl overdoses. This is referring to more of the uh, black market made in China, shipped here in a powder form made in, you know, no quality control, et cetera. Um, and uh, it, it is what's considered butyl fentanyl, acetyl fentanyl, or car fentanyl, which is the animal tranquilizer one. These are the ones that are really, um, you're hearing about now, causing these overdoses. However, people can overdose on standard opioids, which include everything from codeine to Percocet, Percodent, Oxycodone, Oxycontin, Hydromorphin, um, uh, heroin. And there's really no distinguishable uh, differences between those things uh, when you're speaking on opioids. Um, most people, yeah. Here. Some of those things you just listed are things that we have in our homes. My husband just had a surgery the other day. He walked to my house right now. I've got a bottle of maybe 10, 15 pills mm -hmm. on the counter of one yeah. of those things. So when I think about it, I know my household's not alone. Who's at risk for coming across these? I mean, where, where's the, who do you see as the risk pool here in Bucks? Well, I think all of us are at risk um, in one shape or another. Um, if you go to pastop.org, um, there's a lot of information on who is at risk and, and what you can do. Um, but I think the transition from experimentation with prescription medication to use, abuse, dependency, and then the movement to heroin. I, I think that strikes a chord in most people who are in their, an opioid dependency now um, or an addiction. Um, and uh, it, unfortunately, it is preventable. I think we are making strides thanks to uh, a large uh, collaboration of agencies, everything from you know, uh, doctors and single county authorities, uh, nonprofit agencies, all really rallying to encourage change in how we prescribe. And so now if you're under 18, you cannot get any more than seven days prescribed for painkillers, an opioid-based painkiller. I'm glad to hear your husband has seven to 15 pills in his bottle rather than 30 or 60 because we are changing the ways now that we're seeing that opioids um, are um, all equivalent. They all pose the same risks. It really just comes down to dosage and purity. If something is weaker, such as a Percocet, it just takes more of it and a person can overdose. Uh, codeine is, you know, unfortunately very abused, uh, very much abused with um, young people through lean, syrup, um, purple drink, and they view it as cough syrup with promethazine and codeine. Sounds harmless, but codeine is molecularly identical to morphine. And so we have to really kind of educate our communities, ourselves, on perceived level of harm about these things and what is actually an opiate. They, they, they all carry the same potential of harm. So we've heard this as a statewide crisis. What, what's the scope of what you see here? Well, in Bucks County, um, for the last eight years, heroin has been identified as the primary drug of use of the folks that we have funded for treatment. So there's an office like ours attached to every county throughout Pennsylvania, the single county authority. And our role is to fund programs that are related to prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery supports. Prior to heroin being the primary drug of use, it was alcohol, but now we see uh, primarily heroin as well as other opiates. So in Bucks County, we have certainly seen an increase in non-fatal as well as in fatal overdoses. We're doing our very best and we have many initiatives in Bucks County to help folks. But as Dave mentioned, uh, the bottom line through the PA Stop 
website, which is so important for families and, and individuals, is that anyone can become addicted. We have uh, a broad-based panel here right now. I'd like to turn this over to Jim and Amy. Jim Kalowski and Amy McCreary. I uh, started this saying that we've got people on both sides of the spectrum. I'm going to introduce yourself, Jim, uh, as a takeoff from the words that anyone can become addicted. I understand that you're in recovery. Oh, that's right. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, my, thank you. My name is Jim Kowalski, and uh, I am a person in recovery. For me, that means I haven't had a drink or drug in over two years. Um, I also am very fortunate and blessed that uh, I get to work uh, with other people in recovery and, and help others to get there. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Bucks County, very short distance from here in Warminster. And um, I'm in it, I still live in Bucks County. Um, and now basically, uh, like Diane said, anyone can be affected by this. It really has nothing to do with race or socioeconomic background, um, not even really family structure. Um, I see plenty of people that come from great families, myself included. Um, it's not really a determining factor in whether or not uh, you'll end up struggling with substance use disorders. Um, I'll say this, there are a ton of um, supports out there. Um, like Diane said, prevention and intervention, uh, treatment and recovery support. Um, on a daily basis, I, as the volunteer coordinator of PROACT down in um, Bristol, Pennsylvania, at the, at the Southern Bucks Recovery Community Center. Um, we do a lot there to help people coming into recovery, help people sustaining and maintaining their recovery. We offer a number of programs um, that will support you in your path to kind of growing and, and, and changing things around and, and recovering. Jim, it's great that you're in recovery and the fact that you've been there, done that, I'm sure it's instrumental when you speak to other people. Go back to how you got on the path to heroin. Was it, you know, some people think, well, you start with just stealing beer from your parents' fridge, you know, or uh, smoking pot. Do you mind speaking to that? Well, uh, when I was, uh, I guess when I was Going into high school, uh, I was very much around what I thought was normal, right? Uh, high school kids party. We drank, we smoked weed, uh, and I did that, you know? Um, I was actually completely against drugs, if you will. I didn't really see alcohol and marijuana the same uh, as hard drugs back then. Um, and uh, I was staunchly, staunchly against drugs. And what happened was uh, right after high school, um, I had a injury, sports injury, playing hockey. I separated my shoulder and uh, I was prescribed Percocets. Um, essentially from there, I already was in kind of a mentality and a lifestyle of partying and things like that. So when I add an opioid into the mix and now I'm physically dependent on that, that evolved to over a decade of progression that led to uh, using heroin on a daily basis. Do you recall how long it took for you to get addicted? I mean, you're taking it for the pain. It's hard, to, it's hard to really pinpoint that. I mean, like I said, I was already using other substances. Um, and you got to understand, I wasn't looking to identify at the time, oh, I'm a drug addict, or oh, I am an alcoholic. Uh, it, it was, it's hard to pinpoint an exact time, but uh, I know that one day you just kind of turn around and you realize things are getting worse and worse. So Jim, when you turn around and you have that realization about yourself and your prescription's done, where do you then turn to get the next Percocet? Or is it anything that you want to get your hands on? So at first, um, this was like uh, early 2000s, and I think now there is a lot more awareness, but back then there wasn't as much awareness of the fact that I could go to any medicine cabinet of any of my friends, and it wasn't like I was stealing medicine regularly, but the point was like people were. They were readily available. I could call up any number of people that I knew my age, different ages, different backgrounds. I mean, it was... 
kind of like behind closed doors. I mean, it, it should be said, like, it, this was all unbeknownst to my family. My family had no idea I was doing this. I mean, they understood that I drank and, and say, partied, but... Uh, there were no outward signs of your being high or in a stupor or, or correct me for proper terminology. I think really it's just... Um, it's easily excusable, right? I could, if I came home intoxicated, I could say I was drunk. I would never say right. otherwise, you know. Um, I think though, it, it was just so readily available. And, and to be honest with you, when uh, it just got to the point that it was too expensive, I switched to heroin because it was cheaper. That's the honest and scary truth of it. So that was after about a decade or is that midpoint in? No, that was, in my mid-20s, so four to five years into it. Amy McCreary is sitting next to you, and Amy's the, uh, the mother of a recovering addict. Yes. Again, congratulations for the recovery. Amy, I'm, I'm looking to you because you've been nodding your head a couple of times, uh, and your eyes perked up when I said, were there signs? Tell us about, uh, and you're not off the hook, Jim. I'm going to be coming back to you. <laughs> but uh, tell us about your story with your son. Um, my son, just like Jim, was uh, born and raised in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and he went to Central Bucks High School. He was given um, all the advantages of a good upbringing. Um, he was a Boy Scout. He played the guitar. He tried baseball, soccer, basketball. He ended up loving football. And um, The All-American Kid. The All-American Kid. And uh, he, like Jim, you know, partied with his friends in high school. Um, and I was aware of the marijuana because he had gotten in trouble with the police a couple times. And we dealt with those legal consequences, which only ended up being in um, doing uh, community service in the beginning. And we took him to counseling and we went to an addictive counselor. So I thought that we had things under wrap but my son was at a party and was offered a Percocet. And my son was in the same mindset of, I'm just gonna have fun. And my son had no idea that Percocet was similar to heroin, none. And his addiction got to a point where he was taking three Percocet a day, which was $90 a day. And that wasn't even getting him high, that was keeping him from getting sick. And because he was in the um, group of people that were partiers, they had access to any and every drug that you'd want to ever get easily. I mean, it wasn't even a problem. And um, he turned to snorting heroin because just like Jim, my son was completely against ever becoming a heroin addict. I mean, he wanted a party, but he never wanted to go down that road that a lot of us believe only happens to the loser junker that, or, uh, the loser um, junkie that's under a bridge. What's the difference between snorting heroin and using heroin? Is it the needle? Um, they, bo they both are using heroin, but they're just different methods of getting it into your body. And the high isn't as good when you snort it up your nose, but at least it was a lie that my son told himself that I'm not shooting heroin, so it's not as bad. But eventually he moved to shooting. So this is happening under your roof. He lived at home at the time? Yes, he did. No clue. I had no, no clue. clue. Mm -hmm. Where's the money coming from? My son uh, worked delivering pizzas, so it was uh, under the table cash, and he paid for his bills. So from my perspective, I thought he was just taking care of life. So he, he had a job. He, he drove. Did. He did. So he was completely functional. If you yes. were look back, what is it that would have been like, oh my gosh, this is happening under my roof? Well, the first thing I want to get across to people in Bucks County in Pennsylvania is the brain as a mother, my reality did not match with a heroin addict. I never expected my family to ever have to deal with heroin addiction. And every sign that I saw my son go through, I was able to justify that it was something else. And here are a few um, examples. Wait, before you go there, did it ever even cross your mind? It's one thing to not want to go there. Nope. So it never, okay. Never crossed my mind. Because uh, we openly talked about it, things to do, not to do. Um, we went to counseling. 
I mean, I did all the things, you know, the parent-teacher conferences, just I was very involved. And I thought, it's my first child, I thought that he was truthful. And I've learned that teenagers are never truthful. <laughs> Even though they'd like to be, they're always hiding a little bit of themselves from their parents because mm -hmm. they're in that teenage time where they're exploring who they are. So that's what happens. But um, my son used to lock himself in the bathroom for a very long period of time. And I would knock on the door, Brett, what are you doing in there? And he's in there with his cell phone. So in my brain, I'm thinking, what are you doing? Mom, I'm pooping. Oh, sorry, sorry. And I'm thinking he's in there, you know, using the bathroom. And, you know, your grandparents used to read a book. Well, now kids use their phone. So I thought he was just relaxing in the bathroom. But what was happening, he was either snorting or shooting it up and then dipping out, which means passing out. And when he would come to, he would come out of the bathroom. I would find um, the charger cord to his cell phone on the bathroom floor. And I was, what is he doing? Oh, he's a sloppy kid. He was using that to tie off his arm to get a vein. I would find him in front of his computer, sleeping like this. And I would look in there and go, wow, that's a weird way to fall asleep. I guess he's really tired from working. Um, I guess he was up late working on homework. Um, so I had these other explanations for the behavior. Um, he had several car accidents. They were little ones. But I find out later it's because he was dipping out and he bumped somebody or hit somebody. Mm -hmm. um, what, what finally gave you the aha moment of my son was working and he ran into a tree and my fiance at the time followed the gurney into the hospital that he was taken to and he heard the paramedic say to the um, physician nurses that there was Percocet on board and after my um, now husband picked up my son he told me that it was reported there was Percocet on board and there was no reason for my son to have a prescription for, for Percocet. So I questioned my son and he uh, said yes, he was taking Percocet, but he didn't have a problem. He could stop it at any time. But I found out later it wasn't Percocet, it was heroin. But it was his way of first shielding himself from the law and second um, shielding himself from his parents and his friends of the shame of using heroin. And I do believe, he didn't believe he was addicted. He still thought that he had control over it, but he did not. Jim, I'm gonna assume in your counseling that sometimes you have uh, the peers or the loved, the support group come to you as well as that person trying to get out of the addiction cycle and into recovery. What advice for those people listening? I mean. It takes guts to confront someone, especially when you have no idea that, I mean, it just wouldn't even be in the realm of conscious. What, what would you say, having been there, to say, look for this, look for that? Um, it's kind of a tough question, I guess. I mean... Um, tough because it varies per drug, varies per individual? I think it varies per individual and per maybe family dynamic. Um, I know a lot of the time, the more that I would say, the more I did things I thought I had to hide, the less communication was there anyway, right? So um, I think it's tough. I do know that um, we do, like there are um, numerous um, in our area, I know this is statewide, but in our area, at least, there's numerous, like the treatment facilities run programs, uh, like family programs, to help educate the family on signs to look for, educate them on baseline what addiction is. Um, but that's why we're here, because families don't know where to go. They don't go out to hear some of that. Uh, it's, it could be written in the paper, but the paper readership is down. So. So I could say that um, both where I work um, for the Council of Southeast Pennsylvania, as well as the Bucks County Drug and Alcohol Commission, as well as you can contact almost every single uh, drug and alcohol treatment facility, and the majority of them. Um, there's an info line that you can call also. Um, there's numerous info lines. You can 
look those up. They're run by the commission, and, and uh, we can absolutely always give ed uh, education. Uh, we can inform, we can educate to the best of our ability, but it goes beyond maybe phone calls too. Uh, I would implore you to look into doing a family education program. How do you get the suspected addict to a family education program, or do you have that education minus that person? Um, I know that the one that we do, as well as a good majority of them, I can't speak for all of them, obviously. Um, it's, it's for the family. It's not for the, the addict in particular. Um, sometimes these can lead to um, interventions with the person that's suffering from substance use, um, but there are plenty of programs out there that are specifically tailored to educate and inform family members on how to handle the situation if there is a suspected problem. So Brent had a car accident that got him in. What got you into recovery? Um, it's tough. I, I didn't exactly choose it. Uh, Neither did Brett. We forced him. I wasn't forced either, to be honest with you. I, uh, I woke up in a hospital and because you overdosed no no um and i i, I basically just uh was able to finally surrender i was finally able to just surrender to the fact that i can't go this route any further and uh, i reached out for help um when i was in the hospital i asked to go to a treatment facility um and uh See, a lot of consequences had come down on me over the years anyway, and it was just a long road that uh, I was just done with. Uh, I, was, I mean, I, I don't know if it's lucky, if it's blessed. I, mean, I can't really decide or I don't really care to try, uh, but all I know is I, I woke up one day and I was done. Now, there was a ton of work. There was a ton of structure. There was a ton of support. I needed a ton of help. I didn't just wake up one day and oh, I'm done, clean my hands of it. Um, in my experience, I, I had tried to do that for years uh, on my own. Um, my Could you ever go a day straight? What's that? Could you have gone a day without using, or is the physical pull such that you can't? I mean, eventually it gets to the point where it's mandatory daily use. Okay. Uh, it does get there. It wasn't, it wasn't like I woke up one day and all of a sudden, like, I need to do heroin every day. Like, it, it, it's a progression. And for me, it was, a, it was a slightly slower one. But, yeah, I mean, there was times where I had stopped using, say, painkillers or opiates of any sort and thought it was okay for me to just drink alcohol. And it turns out for a guy like me, um, it all kind of is one and the same. There, there's more to it than just the substance or the chemical um it was a lifestyle and it was also um you know i believe it to be an illness i believe that i have something in me that compels me right i, I have a disease that centers in my mind and something that will compel me to go back no matter the, the issue isn't always stopping although a physical dependence makes that harder um, i believe the issue is staying stopped for me um, i've stopped a few times, but staying stop was something that I needed the support. I needed the help. I needed a structure and a, and a ton of different avenues that I could take towards recovering. I'm going to uh, turn this over to the Garazos. Pam and Mike Garazzo are here with us today, and uh, they've been really outspoken about this issue long before it was termed a, a crisis because this is something they've lived in their household. Pam? One of the things I wanted to say is that with my son Carlos, I found out that I had to uh, limit the opportunities for him, in other words, uh, especially once he turned 18. I didn't give him the option of, of using drugs. It was like, if you're going to live here with me, you're not going to use drugs, and if you get into any legal trouble, my help stops there. I'm not going to get you an attorney. Um, as he progressed through drugs, he started with pot, by the way, and I know a lot of parents think that, oh, it's just smoking pot or just taking a beer, and not a big deal. 
But Carlos, if he were here, would tell you that it was a very big deal from, for him because although he started with pot smoking at age 15 and a half, by 16 he had already progressed to heroin and crystal meth and lots of other long, long laundry list of drugs. Quite an acceleration. Yeah, yeah. Well, in his case, so Carlos is one of these people who did not, uh, prescription drugs was not the avenue in which he started taking drugs. He was uh, a person who was never confident in his abilities, who struggled a lot with the self-worth and the self-image, who even though he had a lot of things going for him, he was a talented musician, he did very well academically in school, he didn't see that in himself. He would find fault with himself constantly. So as he told me and others, in order to escape from his problems, he sought out a friend who was smoking pot, had the friend come over, bring the drug with him, and I actually caught them in my house uh, when I smelled the pot and realized this is something I haven't smelled since college days in dorm. Uh, and I confronted Carlos about his pot use. He was 15 and a half. And I immediately got him into um, what's called an outpatient recovery type of program with other teenagers, a very well-known program in the area, uh, which actually for him, as he told me years later, turned out to be a conduit to get more drugs because Carlos was not ready to quit. He didn't see, as, um, as was pointed out by James, he didn't see it as an issue. He thought the pot, sm pot smoking was perfectly fine. But by age 16, as I said, he had, he had um, moved on to heroin. He suffered at age 18 a grand mal seizure from what's called a pharma party or a Skittles party where kids go and they dump all kinds of drugs into a, a, um, a bowl and they literally reach in, grab a handful of pills and take them, usually with beer or some kind of alcohol to wash it down. As a result of that, Carlos got into a car with somebody the next day when I thought he was at school and um, uh, took crystal meth and had an overdose and almost died. And even after that, he wasn't convinced. He was convinced for a while, but that was short-lived. He wasn't convinced that he needed to be off drugs. He then got caught um, with a quantity of marijuana that caused him to get a felony <clears throat> conviction for intent to sell. And that's the point at which I said, um, you, need, you need to go into rehab. I, I'm not going to help you. You suffer whatever the legal consequences are. He, he, was in, um, he had a probation officer at the time that was assigned to him. And he went to a rehab program, but again, he didn't take it seriously. He wasn't ready to quit. He stayed in the program for a number of days, exited the program, and still kept using. Exited because he was over 18 and could leave? Uh, exited because, well, partially because at 12 days into the program, the insurance said that he was done, that this was sufficient, and I not being educated any better than that, I thought, okay, he's fine. He's going to do fine with right. this. And again, showing there were so many times when he didn't show any outward signs uh, to me. Uh, although if I look at them, as you were saying, Amy, cumulate over time, things like he went from being the top student in his class at Pensbury High School, one of the top students, to barely uh, graduating high school. He went to uh, his, his circle of friends changed. He was secretive. Uh, packages were being delivered to the house. People were coming around looking for him, you know, saying that he owed them money. I mean, things that, you know, he would always explain away. Well, I tried to sell them my guitar, and, you know, they fi figured that I, I overcharged them, so that's why they're here, Mom. You know, uh, packages being delivered that I found out about later, he would have a friend go. He would have them delivered to a friend's house who was an adult. And uh, things like bath salts. He said, Mom, these are bath salts. I just want to take a bath. You know, and here he was, he was smoking the bath salts and getting high from them. Uh, air duster that's used to clean computers. I found empty cans. So eventually, I did find at age 18, I found a heroin needle in his room, a needle and a little pack of what I thought might be heroin. I figured I've got to get proactive. He's not going to do this on his own. So I called his probation officer and said, he's got a problem. He's not just using pot anymore. He's now using God knows what other drugs. So he did get into rehab, but I found that I had to take a stance and say, you can't live with me anymore. Um, and it was the point, the point at which he became the most successful and decided he had to turn his life around was when he had no options left. He had nowhere to live. He was living on the street. 
Um, we obviously loved him, but told him that we couldn't support him. I told him that if he came back to the house, I would call the police, that it was a violation of his probation. And he finally said, what do you want me to do? I said, what do you think you should do? So he, he went into a program. He went into a rehab. Wow, that's tough parenting. So, yeah. And it, tough decisions. It was I hard. Mean. It was hard because who wants to see their child suffer? Because I knew it's not just the family suffers. The, the person with the addiction suffers. You know, they, they, as was pointed out, this is a disease. This is a primary chronic disease that was impacting his brain. And all the decisions he, were, he made were geared towards getting that drug, you know. I hear the word disease. I hear the word illness. I believe it. And I know, and I put that out there because some people, it's just a questionable thing, but is everyone wired? I'm going to look to Dave for this. Is everyone wired to be addicted? Or can we have someone taking the exact same path as Jim, Brent, and Carlos and come out on the other side with no problem? You know, literally be able to recreational. You know. I, I think that's where perceived level of harm is a big issue. You know, perceived there are level <coughs> of harm. You perceived say? level of harm about substances. You know, as as we know, I mean, alcohol is a legal substance. You know, uh, for those 21 and over, many people use it recreationally and responsibly without any serious consequences. Um, I won't go into health and etc. But um, and we have another substance, cannabis, marijuana, which is moving along those same lines into, you know, uh, acceptance here as another recreational drug, which theoretically can be used responsibly uh, in similar ways. However, you know, there's a bit of titration. This amount will respond to, to a certain level of euphoria as compared to this amount of alcohol responds to this amount of euphoria. So there are issues with dosage and titration, which are concerns of mine, and I think a lot of people in the room and in the field. Um, but I think we are wired to want to feel good. We wake up every morning as human beings. We want to feel happy. We want to feel good. So we engage in activities that usually require skill and effort uh, in order to solicit uh, some endorphins, uh, neurotransmitters in the brain, specifically dopamine, serotonin are the two major ones, which result in pleasurable uh, euphoric feelings. Uh, short acting, very you know, minuscule uh, reaction, but enough to put a smile on our face and make, enough to make us happy. So we all are drug-seeking individuals and you know, as human beings. We want to feel high, we want to feel happy. Um, we even have what's called endogenous opioids in our body. And these are you know, drugs that result in pleasurable, warm feelings, such as maternal bonding, when an infant is brought to its mother in the hospital for the first time and skin-on-skin -skin contact. There's actually a bill on your, uh, a, a liner on your bill that says maternal bonding. Thirty-five dollars. Mm. It's to pay for the nurse to be in the room to place that infant skin on skin, so that you actually get what's called oxytocin delivered. So that baby and that mom learn very quickly that when they cuddle, they feel good. They feel high. And so yes, we all 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 are wired to feel to want to engage in drug-seeking behaviors. But once the brain gets a taste for something that is not short-acting and requires a lot of effort, something that's long-acting, powerful, requires no skill and effort that brain begins to malform. And that's where the disease model looks at, is actually the brain changes to a point where it can be viewed m medically as a disease because there's actually some organic changes in the brain structure that are motivating that person to do things they normally would not do in order to have that unnatural levels of pleasure that is associated from the drugs uh, coming from an external source. Dave, the progressions that we've heard here, you've dealt with hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, addictions over the years. Is this similar to what you've heard? I mean, w w what else can you add that, that, again, our audience right now is for people no. looking to see, oh my gosh, is there a problem under my roof? Is there a problem with the boy or girl that I'm dating? And if so, what do I do about it? How do they approach it with that person? How do they get help? So I, I once heard you speak about that progression of, it, it sounds yeah. to me very similar to what Jim said. Yeah. And I will say uh, to hear about Carlos starting with marijuana, my gosh, we've got, this is becoming mainstream legal uh, in so many states right now. 
and we hear this is, you know, th it's not the gateway drug, but uh, this conversation certainly gives me some pause. So as far as something that parents should be looking for, and I'm going to turn to the parents and to Jim and anyone, if they want to chime in on this, the whole purpose is a interaction. Yeah, I, I think if there's one thing that I can recommend is if you have a gut feeling, listen to your gut feeling. Um, don't ever doubt yourself because as parents, I'm a parent, and we, we want to believe what we want to believe. And, you know, for many of us, our children can do no wrong. Yes, they can get bad grades and get into trouble, but we would like to think that, you know, they really are that wonderful person um, who uh, makes healthy decisions every day. Um, and sometimes they don't. And it's okay. Um, just realize that, you know, if you have a gut feeling, uh, go with it. I'm, I'll, I'll let Diane talk about, you know, some other things that she sees with her agency. Thank you so much. I would say first and foremost, uh, as Dave mentioned, if there's a feeling that something's not right, something's not right. So there are a number of individuals in Bucks County that are ready, willing, and able to help our residents. We exist for the taxpayer. We want residents to know that they can call our office anytime and they can call the statewide hotline anytime a resident has, has a question. The state line, statewide phone number is 1-800-662-4357. That's the Pennsylvania line. Our office in Warminster, Monday through Friday, is 215-773-9313. We spend so much time talking about heroin and opiates and specific drugs. It's really a substance use issue that we should be worried about. And families who are not concerned because they haven't heard about pills or opiates or heroin should really pay closer attention. I think you've heard today the concerns about underage alcohol use and marijuana use as well. So we often tell parents, please don't be relieved that your children are just underage drinking or that they're just using marijuana. And I give an example, which is that we're involved in the involuntary commitment process for minors. There is a way to, for your child to be involuntarily committed to treatment. Every child who has come through that process that we started about a year and a half ago has started with marijuana. So it's important for individuals to know that they need to pay attention to not just heroin, not just pills, not just other opiates, but also to underage drinking and to marijuana as well. Okay, let's take a step back here. So you've got this we have an involuntary commitment program. Yes. So let's just say I'm that the mother of the 15-year-old. I'm thinking there's a problem. I know there's a problem. I've smelled pot in my house. I've seen uh, th the line on the vodka bottle in the cabinet go down. Uh, I don't know at what point it's just, okay, a kid's a kid, a kid. Where I follow my gut. I make the call. I get you know, huge fights at home. Tell me what that involuntary commitment program means. Does my child still go to school? Is it an, what is it? So the involuntary commitment, uh, Act 53 in Pennsylvania, is to, for uh, minors to receive a drug and alcohol assessment as well as potentially mandatory treatment. It is not a step that we take lightly, and there are a few steps beforehand. So that parent that you mentioned that may have found something in the home, they see the alcohol is being reduced in the bottles or whatever they're concerned about, there are other steps we'd like them to take first so that they don't go right to the involuntary commitment. Um, every school district in Bucks County has a student assistance program, and our agency funds that through the Council of Southeast Pennsylvania, where there are trained individuals assigned to each school to help identify students at risk. A parent can refer their own child to the student assistance program. Students can refer other students. Teachers can refer. It's an anonymous program where students are referred to the program and met with by outside facilitators, outside individuals who have experience. And there's a free of charge assessment that's conducted, drug and alcohol assessment and mental health as well. And then if there is a referral to treatment, the child can choose to or not to take advantage of that. There are intervention programs throughout the county as well where families can work with individual interventionists if they want to plan some sort of intervention for the family. But if therapy has been tried, other types of treatment have been tried, intervention has been tried, and the child is still refusing treatment, 
that's where Act 53 might come in. So the process is quite simple. A family member, resident of Bucks County, one parent has to be a resident of the county, would call our office and speak with one of our staff. We'll walk the family through the process. Again, we'll ask if they've already done the student assistance program and so on. We'll advise them how they can access the petition. The petition is completed at the Bucks County Justice Center, so the parent does have to go to the Justice Center, uh, file the petition, and then our agency pays for the legal representation of the minor. Uh, the minor appears in court along with the parent or legal guardian. Uh, it's a very quick process. It takes less than a week. And the same day that the assessment is mandated by the judge, we bring an assessor to the Justice Center to meet with the family and with the child. And then the treatment is mandated based on the results of that assessment. Okay, I'm back to wearing the hat of that mom, and you just scared the daylights out of me because I have great plans for this kid going to college. Yes. He's got a 4.0, or he used to, mm -hmm. and you just we just brought the judicial system in. What does this do to what we grew up being scared about, our permanent record? What does this do to my child's future? If I introduce him to this and he's in front of a judge, what's the black marks? Great question. Uh, first, to the student assistance program. That is a confidential program in the school, and it does not become part of the student's school record first. Regarding the Act 53 involuntary commitment process, that is also done in a closed chamber with the juvenile judge, juvenile court judge. It's also a closed process, and there's not a permanent record for the minor. So, not a permanent record. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go right to you. You lift. So Carlos ended up getting convicted, a felony conviction. Uh, a scholarship that he had to college was taken away. That was a big setback for him, but I'd rather have him take a different path and be alive than go to college and get down the road in further trouble, continuing with drugs and, and end up on the street dead. So, you know, I know I had friends who, when I said, you know, I was in Carlos's room and, and I called his probation officer because I found a needle, they were aghast, like, why would you call this probation officer? He's going to get into more trouble. And I said, I have to protect him when he's not looking out for himself. So I always took the stance that anything I can do to help him when he can't see the danger he's in. Um, and as far as the connection, between pot and other drugs, as I said, Carlos, if he were here, and this is Carlos, by the way, I always try and show his picture because it's important to see that he's, he's everybody's kid. He's, he's your neighbor. Um, Carlos, if he were here, would tell you that definitely pot was a gateway for him. That pot, he, he would smoke marijuana and feel as if he wasn't getting a big enough high. It wasn't a sustainable high. He wanted something more. So he went and got other drugs. He even at one point was taking ketamine, which is a large animal tranquilizer. So, you know, that's just how deeply that he was involved in drugs. Um, but I think that people have to recognize that. It, the literature and the statistics now are coming out in states like Colorado that crime has increased, motor vehicle accidents involving pot smokers have increased, that people have died from taking from smoking pot because of what it's led them to do uh, to themselves or to others. So uh, I think for parents, looking at any changes that your child is going through, and we know that the teenage years, something simple like sleeping, you know, teenagers, especially on the weekends when they can sleep in, they sleep in. I had a problem where Carlos, he wasn't waking up. He, for things that he loved doing, he loved playing the drums, he loved playing the guitar and he was in jazz band and he just wouldn't wake up. He was so lethargic, he couldn't get out of bed to go to rehearsal to something that previously he had really enjoyed doing. So looking at him wearing long sleeves in the summer and asking him what's going on and then realizing that he's not gonna tell me that he's been shooting up and his arms have needle tracks up and down them. Uh, as I said, finding things, uh, things around the house that he was using to get high, his belt, you know, you mentioned the phone cord, his belt that I threw away a couple times because it was this old twisted belt and he took it out of the trash and told me years later that I needed that belt because that was the best belt for me to use to, to you know, tie my arm up to, to use heroin. So I think not turning a blind eye, realizing that you're saving your child, even if they don't, you're, even if your hopes and dreams for them have to change, even if the path that they have to take to get to 
uh, their end goal. Carlos, even though he was devastated that he couldn't go away to um, the university, he started taking co uh, courses at Bucks. He started paying for it himself. So I think it was kind of more meaningful that he was using his own money, especially when he was clean. He had the money to use. Um, another thing that he found very helpful besides going to NA meetings or AA meetings, because you can go to either one, doesn't matter what the addiction is, uh, exercising. He was fortunate enough to be in a re wonderful recovery house, and one of the things that they had uh, available was uh, were weights. So we started getting into exercising. So when he had these thoughts and feelings about inferiority or that his life wasn't going well, he could refocus himself. You know, he could use things they learned in the 12 steps. He could exercise. He could cook because he liked to cook. You know, that type of thing. Refocus his energy. Um, but he did say that there wasn't a day that went by, even when he was 20 months clean, that he didn't think about the drug because it's just so pervas pervasive on the brain and the brain chemistry. And that goes along with the idea of, of who you're staying with, what kind of people are you hanging around with. And if you are clean and you've been fighting, and as you had mentioned, um, what winds up happening is you get yourself into a position it was, it was explained to us as Pavlov's dogs. And with that, when uh, Pavlov was working with dogs to see what, how they would respond. And <clears throat> he taught them, the bell rings, you're going to get food. It got to a point where if he didn't give them any food and the bell rang, the res physical responses were the same. And it's the same thing with the drugs. You put yourself into a position where you are with people who are using the drugs, then you wind up remembering, your brain reminds you of how good it was, how good you felt, and it's extremely difficult to break away from that. If you don't mind, um, you asked, you know, what does the, re the wiring of the brain, <clears throat> and when you really look at, you know, um, what Pam and, and Mike have shared is, is, is yes, um, the brain, responds to all drugs similarly so you know is there is there an argument about you know is alcohol or cannabis uh, um, you know a, a gateway drug uh, for many people it is um, and the thing to take home is that it is a drug a drug is you know anything that alters the brain in, in that way and when you really look at the way the brain works you know Mike and Pam both mentioned he had things that he did for pleasure you know and the recovery uh, uh, house that he was at had exercise that dopamine and that serotonin that is naturally produced, when you look at just our daily rewards, the things that we engage in for uh, reward that require skill and effort, a conversation increases your dopamine, which is our feel-good drug, by about 5%, a conversation with a friend. Um, playing a musical instrument, sketching something, drawing art, culture, uh, about 15%. Physical exercise is about a 25% increase in your dopamine production in your brain from wow. baseline. So, I mean, that is why people put forth this effort to feel good. Um, and then there's, you know, uh, um, you know uh, intimate relations, sex, 50% increase in dopamine. Um, why is that such a high reward to, of course, for survival? You know, we need to have our species live on, you know, um, so it's rewarded. Um, but that's about as really good as it gets. Um, is that 50% increase in dopamine. That's naturally as much as we're really going to see. Um, then when we look at things like cannabis or marijuana, it's about 100 to 150% increase in dopamine. Cocaine, right. about a 300% increase. Methamphetamine, anywhere from 800 to 1100% increase. Opioids, a 1400% increase. So when you look at this drug-seeking behaviors that we all engage in, you know, it, it's what is deemed um, acceptable and healthy. And really, yeah, for parents out there, for families who are questioning, well, how do you get your kids into, you know, activities such as sports, art, culture, whatever, and you have to provide them with opportunities, A, um, when they engage in it, you have to ask them, did they like it? If they did well at it, you know, recognize it and, and reward them um, with recognition. That recognition will hopefully make them want to do it again. If it's not something they enjoy, they can move on and try something else and experiment because youth are supposed to be experimental in those critical periods between 12 and 21. And let them find what produces their dopamine naturally because if you don't, if they don't find it, somebody else will. 
And Mike points out you have to be careful who you surround yourself with because if you surround yourself with other people who are not engaging in pro-social things, they will find that antisocial behaviors provide a very high dose of dopamine and it can bring you down a very unhealthy you know, uh, road that will affect both you, your families, and your loved ones. So, um, you know, the brain is a very interesting thing. Um, and uh, I think... Can it be unprogrammed? <laughs> I was going to turn yeah. to Jim to say, you're 20 months sober? Did you say two? Over two years. Now. Over two years. Because wow. each month counts, each day counts, huh? But can, with those organic changes, can it, can it rewind? Can it reset? Or, or is this something, do you, like Carlos, think of it every day? Can I ask one question? Sure. Move on? Yeah, please, Thank Amy. Um, it was Act 53. Um, as a parent that notices that their children are drinking and smoking pot, and there's always a fear of the legal system. You don't want your child doing the supposedly <laughs> appropriate behavior for a teenager to get in trouble with the law. So if you go through this process when your child is just drinking alcohol and smoking pot, are there any legal ramifications if there's like pot in their bedroom or alcohol in their bedroom or, because I know a lot of parents would say, I don't want to call this and do this Act 53 because I don't want my child to get in trouble with the law because you think it's still a small, normal, manageable Yeah, not situation. even just pot or alcohol, but anything worse. I've had a parent say to me, I see it here, I turn it in, he goes to jail. And I guess that, it, not I guess, but that's exactly what Pam's saying is, do, do you want them in heaven or Harvard? You know, you want them. But for me, if I knew huh? that I could go and do this and not get into any kind of legal trouble, I may have reported it before he got to heroin. Mm -hmm. Well, the Act 53 process is simply that um, the sheriff's office does serve the minor, so the parent has to identify where to find the child. It is most often at the home. They generally don't go to the school, uh, but it's usually outside a playground, somewhere near the home. They don't search the home at all. Um, and they've not brought any charges against minors. The judges really want to work with, with minors and get them the help that they need. Thank you. That helps, because then there's not that fear that you're throwing your child right away into the legal system. So there are always... just getting them help first. Yes, but frankly, there are always complicating factors. So uh, again, this is for minors ages 12 up to 18 right up to 18, um, they may be involved in the juvenile probation system. So they may have some other pending charges. So there, there are some different shades of gray. Yes, yeah. Because I agree with um, Pam mm -hmm. that towards the, when I really knew he was addicted, I didn't care about the law anymore. I cared about my son's life. And my son now goes to Bucks County Community College. He's working. Great. Um, it's not the um, path that I had envisioned and dreamed of but I'd rather have him alive. And Pam would, you both would agree with that. And also you have to look at, now Carlos got into trouble with the law when he was still a minor, um, not for the felony conviction, but just you know for, for having, for smoking pot, he got caught smoking pot. And for him, the community service that he did was really not a deterrent. I mean, he was very compliant. He was always very compliant with what he had to do legally. Uh, but it wasn't a deterrent, and really, frankly, jail time was not a deterrent either. But I wasn't reluctant for a minute to, um, to have him uh, realize the consequences of his actions. You know, we talked about it all the time, and when he was clean, he could see that my not enabling him and my taking this perhaps more seriously than he did, that it, it was actually helpful in his path. Mm -hmm. So this is the most frightening thing that a parent can ever go through. You know, f first, I knew from the beginning of the pot smoking that this was going to be serious, you know, uh, partly because I could see Carlos wasn't taking it seriously. Um, and I think the other thing that comes into play is addressing the whole person and why are they using drugs? Um, what is the motivation? What are they trying to escape from? What in their lives do they need to, to work on to change? And Carlos was in therapy um, to try and do that. But 
so even in programs for school, DARE is a fabulous program for fifth graders. What happens in your school district after that? What can you try and get your school district to do as the next steps? What about junior high? What about high school? What about looking at um, helping a child to learn mindfulness skills, to learn self-coping skills, to, to know that it's okay to have a defeat. It's okay to, to lose a game. It's okay to be in pain. You know, here's how we cope with those types of things. So I think anything that you as a parent can do, either on your own or to try and get organized efforts um, to do regarding getting the schools to pay more attention to this in terms of helping the child with um, dealing with whatever they're going through is helpful. Which does take some education on their family history as well. Mm -hmm. And so we say that if some, uh, a parent had a family history of diabetes or heart disease, they would share with their children some risk factors and sort of what to look out for so that they could prevent it. So the child is as educated and armed as possible to know what to look for or what to avoid in terms of if it's sugar foods and exercise and so on. We ask parents to do the same with substance use as well that they share that they're with their child, that they are at risk so that they're armed and ready and have some skills so that if and when they're encountering the individual that's, that's offering them the alcohol or other drugs, they're prepared and they have the knowledge to know, I'm at risk, I better watch out. Diane, you've brought some stuff yes. sitting in front of you. Now, we, we've talked about you know, the escalation to heroin, the using mm -hmm. it. Uh, tell us what you have here. So uh, the good news is in Bucks County, because of the partnerships that we have, not just in this room, but th throughout the county, from county leadership to all of our community residents, our community residents now understand that our number one prevention program is how to get medications out of the hands of individuals who shouldn't have them. That means that Bucks County is the county that leads the state of Pennsylvania in the collection of unused, unwanted, and expired medications. Um, Pennsylvania statewide has collected about 300,000 pounds, pounds. pounds of medications. Bucks County alone in April will be weighing in and we believe will be at about 100,000 pounds as of April. That's from 2010 to present. Uh, that means that Bucks County has collected a third of the volume that the rest of, of the state has, which is quite incredible. Did we start sooner? We started in 2010, and I will say that that was before some of this current discussion would have occurred. And some of the thinking at that time was not so much about diverting medications, but it was about protecting the water system. And individuals, community residents in Bucks County, community mobilizers as we call them, were very involved in community education. We now have 34 permanent drop boxes. They look like a green uh, mailbox. They're located throughout the county in various municipalities and police stations and the county courthouse and the justice center where individuals, community residents can come in with their unused, unwanted, expired medications, just drop them in as you would a letter in a mailbox and they're destroyed outside of Pennsylvania. We encourage individuals to bring those in daily and people do. Twice a year, we have a DEA take back. Uh, the next event is April 28th. It's a Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, the last event was in October, and we had 51 places throughout the county that community residents could bring their medications. Great. Again, we don't <clears throat> want people to wait until then. And what we see is a trend where individuals are bringing more medications to the daily 34 uh, boxes and less to the once a year or twice a year events. But meanwhile, we know that there are some people who are living in homes where you may have contractors coming in and out, cleaning staff. There are folks who are selling their homes that are being advised by realtors to watch out for the medications. So we have purchased, these are called pill pods. It's a plastic case and it has its own combination. When you undo the combination and open the box, this box will hold six or eight vials of medication. You can keep this separate. You could have two in your home, keep the pet medication separate from other medications, children's medications, and so on. It just means that you could keep this in your home and it be assured that it's locked up. 
Uh, in the end, you just open it up and you can bring the vials to the pillboxes um, for disposal. And this is a disposal bag. You'll know that the Attorney General, Josh Shapiro, ensured that some counties in Pennsylvania got many of these bags. Those were for counties that were more rural and didn't have a lot of drop boxes. We didn't qualify, so our office purchased our own. This is just like a Ziploc bag. You open it up, you drop in between 45 and 60 pills, depending on the size of the pill. There's a little charcoal filter. Add a little warm water, smush it up a little bit, and this can go in the trash. So we're trying to devise different ways for community residents just to make it a little bit easier so that they can dispose of their medications. Where does one get either of those? They could call our office, 215-773-9313, or just walk into our office at 600 Lewis Drive in Warminster. Is there a charge? There is no charge. So what about the other, the little white things right in front of you? I believe that's Narcan. So we understand, you know, given the opiate epidemic that we're attempting to reduce overdose, which sadly continues to increase, not a day goes by that we don't see an obituary and scratch our head and wonder, this was a young person that seemed to have a bright future. Many more individuals are courageously including in their obituary that the family, had, the child or, uh, or adult had struggled with addiction. We know this is a tool, this is just a tool, but we can't help folks unless they're saved. So what you see before you is one dose of Narcan. Uh, this is to reverse overdose, and we have made a purchase of uh, Narcan for Bucks County residents. No one needs a prescription for this medication. Anyone can walk into a pharmacy and ask for Narcan, and that's what they would ask for, Narcan or Naloxone, and the pharmacy hopefully would have it in stock, and if not, would be able to get it for the individual. There is a charge. Individuals would have to use their insurance copay. But community residents could walk into our office. We prefer they come in on Mondays or Tuesdays from uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and we will sit with the individual, talk with that person, about how to recognize an opiate overdose, watch a very brief video, and speak with our staff. And the family would leave with this box, which contains two of those doses of Narcan. Thank you. Uh, it looks just like this. It's very simple to use. It's in a blister pack. Um, and we're making this available to Bucks County residents. So if I went into CVS, Rite Aid, wherever, I could ask for it without a prescription, and my insurance would pay for it? You could ask for it without a prescription, and insurance would, pay, would cover a portion, depending on what your insurance plan showed. But even though it's not for me, even though this, there's not a script that says it's for whomever in my house? Yes? Yes, uh, because there's a standing order at the state level. So there is a standing order. There is technically a script for it, if need be. So most insurances will cover it. There are a few uh, that may question it or decline it, and you have to reapply, but most do. But don't let that thwart you from getting it. Correct. And don't Did let you that have that, Pam? No, we didn't use Narcan. We, Were we you aware of it? Was it as a prolific uh, in the market? It was just coming into being the last time that Carlos was clean. So it's just um, been since uh, November of 2014 that Act 139 was passed that allowed emergency responders and really community members to have Narcan. Um, since that time, uh, I would say in the last two and a half years, Bucks County has made a significant effort toward ensuring that uh, folks who are on the front lines, emergency responders, police officers, uh, have Narcan in their possession. And no matter where you are in Bucks County, uh, you will be covered by Narcan by our police departments. And certainly Dave knows this as he's been coordinating it. Our law enforcement officers have saved over 500 lives since we started this project. I, I, I'm torn between saying I'm so sorry to hear that. 500 is a large number, and then I'm delighted that they were saved and hopefully into recovery. We've talked about programs. Uh, s people are concerned about the cost, what insurance doesn't cover. I know that at one point, Diane, I had a, a friend uh, who needed alcohol treatment and was really buttoned up against walls, did not have the money for it, was finally at a point where her family could get her in. And, you know, insurance dollars is just such a real thing. What, when someone calls your office what, and doesn't have the proper insurance, 
what do you, what do you tell them? Well, our office is there to support Bucks County residents. I get it. So we fund folks for treatment if they're Bucks County residents and if they're uninsured, meaning they have no insurance at all, including uh, any HMO or medical assistance, or if they're underinsured. So that individual may have qualified for some assistance from us, uh, perhaps for their copay. Uh, if a copay is such that the individual would not be able to enter treatment, then we may be able to help them out. We want to make sure that folks, especially those in our priority populations, have access to treatment. And so we want to ensure that folks don't have a barrier. A few years ago, our main funding source, Pennsylvania Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, mandated that we not even pay so much attention to the residency requirements if it's an individual who's in the priority category. And those folks are pregnant women who are substance abusing, folks who are using um, IV drugs, uh, veterans, we also prioritize adolescents and older adults as well. So I would say first and foremost, if the individual is encountering any trouble with their insurance and with the copays, they should call our office to see if we can help. And the hotline, they could get that uh, help on a Saturday or Sunday? Yes, the hotline is 1-800-662-4357. Does it spell anything cute? Uh, get help oh that, that's <laughs> spells something practical that's better than anything else what would you like to add here amy jim you know i asked you and then we were diverted do you is it something you crave every day um no not at all good what message do you have for someone who's who is thinking of someone they know or is that person um you, you said it was tough. What, what kind of message to say, you know, get to the other side? I think one of my favorite things, one of my favorite sets, we heard a lot of stats, a lot of information today. And one of my favorites is that there are over 23 million people in America that are living in recovery from substance use disorder. I'm just one of them. Uh, it's, it's amazing because there are stages of change. Um, there are obstacles along the way to finding a life in recovery. However, there are tons of people in this area and throughout the state and throughout the country that are doing it. There is a ton of hope. There is a lot of stigma behind um, the disease of addiction. And really my hope is that uh, we continue to kind of smash that stigma and we realize that this is more of a public health issue. And we realize that there is a ton of support out there existing already. And you've been given a number of um, websites and phone numbers and organizations that you can contact and there are plenty of people um, not only in this room obviously but all across our county and the state that have dedicated their lives and their careers to helping um, I'm just happy to be a part of that really I'll tell you just to, I don't um, of course there may be a passing thought of a, a drink because we live in a society where yeah. there's bars on every Super Bowl corner. weekend coming yeah. um, but there is a gigantic and huge difference between a passing thought and an absolute crippling obsession. Mm -hmm. And while in active addiction or alcoholism, um, that driving force is like nothing anybody could imagine until you've experienced it. Um, however, the hope is that just because you have that at one point or you consider yourself an addict or somebody else considers you an addict, which is even worse in some ways if you don't realize it yourself. Um, the hope is there and the hope is that you don't have to live like that. There are ways out. There is a way to recover to the point where not only are you a functioning member of society, but a person that is freed from that obsession, which is the ultimate. And uh, there's hope, there's support, and there's a lot of it. Uh, that, that's really all I have to say about that. Thank you. Yeah, just picking up on what Jim said, um, you know, I try and focus on the hope. There is there's hope for everyone, and even if you fall down, even in Carlos's case where he had numerous 
periods of recovery and then, you know, relapse. Uh, each day was a new day, and that's what you have to focus on. You know, let me get through this now. Don't look back about what got me here. Try not to look too far ahead, although you have goals. But concentrate on the here and now. There is also hope and help for parents. There are resources for parents. Uh, there are support groups for parents. You are not alone. There are many of us in, in this situation with you. So reach out and don't feel like there's nothing for you as a parent. There is definitely support for parents as well and, and uh, caregivers. Just back to the stigma, I highly doubt that there are many families through Bucks County or Pennsylvania who have not been touched in some way, be it you know, with their own DNA in an extended, very personal or an extended way, or through their neighborhood, their community, their church. We all know this. and coming together to try and, and see it for what it is, just a pervasive, insidious thing in our community that we just need to lock arms and do what we can to beat together. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Yes, can Amy. I add something? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Um, as a parent to any other parents, um, I would recommend have no tolerance in your house for any kind of drug use before the age of 21 and that's marijuana or alcohol, and it's because the brain is changed by those substances, which I did not know as a parent. Um, so I have two younger children, and I have drug testing kits on the top of my refrigerator, and in my home, I randomly drug test my kids, and if they come up hot, positive, they're grounded for two weeks. If they come up, if they just confess, before I do the drug test, it's only a week. Each child is different when it comes to the um, discipline that will work with them, but that's worked with my children. I uh, caught my daughter twice um, smoking pot. She came clean. Uh, she went down to Made in America in September, and she was walking in the crowd, and there was a lot of marijuana smoke down there, and she was holding her boyfriend's hand, and she hit the deck, and it was because she did not want to smell that and have it go into her body and then come up hot and get, a tr and get in trouble at home. So I talk to my kids at home why you can't do these things and that you can tell your friends, I'm going to test you and you're going to get grounded. So it gives them the resources to say no. And then there's one other thing. Wait, where do you get that, those tests? Well, you can get them at any local pharmacy, but um, there's sites online where you can get a box of them for $250 where it ends up only being $5 a test. When you do um, the pharmacy, it's about $40, which is very expensive to have on hand um, and if anybody wants to contact me offline on how to get those I'll let them know um, but there was one other thing darn 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 uh, yeah I talked to my kids about what it does to their brains oh pro uh, project X I don't know if people have heard about this you tell your child if they're in a situation where they need to be removed they can text you the letter X and then as the parent you can call them and say Hi, Susie. Just want to let you know, Grandpa just came into town, so I'm going to come by and pick you up because he really wants to see you. That way they don't have to knock out their friends, but they're safe. So it's mm. just another little tool to help them have access to help without losing face. Thank you. And also, I think Amy brings up a good point. With home testing, I think it's very important, as Amy said, have a plan. And so the council, uh, in collaboration with the Bucks County Drug and Alcohol Commission, uh, several years ago now, I guess, uh, put together a home drug testing uh, handbook Ooh. on how to go about it. Oh, um, awesome. Because there are do's and don'ts. You want to do it in a very effective way, because the last thing you want to do is that young person will run out and, you know. So um, check out that. Um, and your Made in America walk made me. I, I can't pass that opportunity up to put a plug out there for the recovery walks. Mm. Um, every year down in Philadelphia, people come from all over the country, believe it or not, um, to walk in uh, one of the largest uh, gatherings of people in recovery, and they march through the streets of Philadelphia with a message of hope. Um, so you can go to a couple different websites to learn more about that and to participate in it if you so be desired. Family members, relatives, loved ones, doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to be in recovery to march. You can just be somebody who's been touched or affected by it. Um, and you can go to the PROACT website, the council's website. I believe the commission's website has a link for it. Um, and it is called the Recovery Walks. So thank you. 
Thank you. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the Bucks County Intermediate Unit for allowing us to use their space for hosting us. That's no coincidence. We just didn't go for a room. Uh, we used this room or we asked them to use it because they are affiliated with all 13 of Bucks County school districts. There's not one from upper, lower, central Bucks County that's exempt from this issue. I'm Marguerite Quinn. I really appreciate the your sharing your personal stories in an effort to come together to help not just the children of Bucks, but the families. And this is not just a children's issue. There's plenty of adults who face it, but thank you.